Hello and welcome to what is going to be a very different video than what you're used to seeing. Today I'm not going to be driving the vehicles, I will be presenting two very popular models. I have here two mid-size three-row SUVs. Why? Because these are arguably the most popular segment of vehicles right now. Modern families don't buy minivans anymore, they buy these things and the list is really long. There's a huge amount of competitors in this segment. Now, obviously I could have had a Kia Telluride or a Hyundai Palisade, even a Honda Pilot, but I couldn't fit them all under this roof. So since the Nissan Pathfinder is all new and the Toyota Highlander is one of the best selling midsize SUVs in North America, I figured, hey, why not pit these two bad boys face to face and compare them in detail? They're both powered by 3.5 liter V6 engines. They both come with all wheel drive and they can both seat seven to eight passengers. Now the Pathfinder is all new for 2022, but it's not exactly all new. It's still riding on the old platform and it's still using the same V6 engine as before, but that's not a bad thing because the Pathfinder's V6 engine was a reliable unit. What did change is that there's no more CVT. Now it's replaced by a nine speed automatic transmission provided by ZF and I will go in detail in a few minutes. However, Toyota offers a hybrid version for the Highlander which you cannot get on the Pathfinder side. Now at this point you're probably wondering, whoa, this is getting very confusing and it is. There are a lot of vehicles of this category to choose from and that's why I'm here and come with me, we're gonna go in detail and check everything these bad boys have to offer. All right, so let's begin with the Toyota Highlander. Now this uh, Highlander came out in 2020, so it's still rather new. And I'm sitting in the most equipped platinum trim because car makers always lend me the most equipped models. But don't worry, the Pathfinder is also a platinum. I don't yet have pricing for the Nissan. This is a $56,000 Highlander. It is as loaded as it can get uh, with the hybrid powertrain, of course. Now, what I do like, however, when I get the fully loaded trims, it allows me to see the kind of options you can add on a Highlander. And honestly, this, is, this could be called a Lexus. It's quite luxurious and refined. Now, what I'm noticing, I have these nice veneers here in the doors, fake wood trim. It looks nice, but they've added this weird gloss over it that makes it kind of shine. I don't know, I would have preferred not having the gloss over it, over it but it does upscale the interior. What I particularly enjoy are the two-tone color uh, combinations that you can get. This one has the brown, chocolate brown on the, on the higher sections of the door and it's well coupled with this beautiful uh, vanilla beige uh, white. It's very fancy. Seating position is also uh, very good in a Highlander. What I like about this vehicle is that it doesn't feel like you're sitting in a truck. You really feel like you're sitting in a big sedan. You sit low, uh, but you also, the seats are really plush. They have a nice bouncy feeling in them. I quite like that. This is, this is the kind of stuff you'll notice during long trips when you're driving this thing for hours, you'll you really feel a great lumbar support in the seat. Contrary to some of its rivals, the Highlander has a standard uh, gear lever for the eight-speed automatic transmission, so it doesn't have buttons, but the center console does offer quite a lot of storage. I've got the standard cup holders here in the front. I got room for my phone. I have not one, but three USB ports, two of them used for charging, and I have auxiliary power here in the front as well. Lots of storage up front, more storage here underneath the infotainment system. That's a nice handy feature. And that shelf is also duplicated right here over the glove box. Now with the center console, Toyota kind of tries to uh, reinvent the wheel. It works, but it doesn't. So you can't really open the center console. What you have is a slider here on top. It gives way to the phone, wireless phone charging device. And then once you lift that, you have access to a small shelf and you can go inside and you can store your, uh, whatever you have, your gear. Now it is quite roomy in there, so you can put quite a lot of junk, but I personally would have preferred an actual console that opens. What happens with this thing here is, look how flimsy it is already. And when you're, you're driving and you have your elbow on it, you hear it? And this is a brand new vehicle, so imagine down the road, this could become loose, so just watch out for that. You have traditional drive modes right here. The Highlander allows you to 
vary between sport, normal, and eco. This is the hybrid model, so I have EV mode, which you're not gonna get on the V6 engine. And there's a trail feature, which I always find very funny, because these are not off-road vehicles. Yes, they have all-wheel drive. They're a bit lifted off the ground, but they're cars, they're not trucks. So don't go off-roading with this thing. Don't go in a rocky trail or in the mud. But this, what this is gonna do is that it's gonna reconfigure the, uh, uh, the traction control system and the transmission mapping to give you a bit more grip on slippery surfaces. And now with the infotainment system. Now, uh, these things get bigger and bigger every year. So yes, the uh, Highlander has a gigantic screen in your face. Um, HVAC controls are all um, still analog, and I like this. You have actual hard buttons for your climate control, heated seats, a nice big volume knob, and a tuning knob as well. So that's well executed. Where it kind of falls apart is in the interface. Now, what I find funny with Toyota vehicles is that you go from one vehicle to the next and it's never the same infotainment system. It's the same software. It looks familiar, but they're all different. None of them is the same. So if let's say you, you buy, I don't know, you, you have a Corolla and you have a Highlander, you're gonna have two completely different systems. Now, allow me to explain. Now this has the traditional home menu, which isn't home. You actually have, you need to press menu to access the home screen where you have your large icons right there. They allow you to have access to all your information for your phone, your Bluetooth settings, your projection, your navigation, etc. Now what Toyota does here is they include a second screen here on the side, which I can have either on the left or on the right side. If I close it on the right, it flips over. So you can't get rid of it. You always have that little tiny screen on the side. And that gives you other information like fuel consumption, how your all wheel drive system is working or your audio. What this allows you to do is do more than one thing at the same time. The idea behind it is smart, but it becomes very confusing. It's, it's not intuitive and it's very cluttered. There's a lot of information at once. You can modify what the system displays. If I go in the settings and I go to customize home screen, I can change the information that's presented and I can also change the layout. But as you can see, I'm always stuck with at least two screens. I can't just have one main menu. So either you like it or not, uh, yes, Toyota wants to allow you to do more than one thing at once, but in the end, what you end up with is a system that's very cluttered in information and there's a bit too much to take in at once. However, for the rest, Bluetooth connectivity goes really well. Everything is, I mean, with, what I like about Toyota systems is that it's the car that finds your phone and not the other way around. A lot of car makers are starting to do this, but Toyota has been ahead of everyone in that game. So it's a lot simpler. Yes, you do have, ac have to access some menus to get there, but once it detects your phone, it connects and you're good to go. So now in the Pathfinder, this is also a platinum trim, so the most equipped Nissan Pathfinder you can buy. And just like the Highlander, it's loaded with fancy creature comforts like this beautiful light brown texture. Now it's important to underline that the uh, Pathfinder is very different inside than its predecessor. And it's a good thing because the old model is really becoming obsolete. I mean, you'd sit inside and it felt like a 10 year old SUV. Everything has changed. And Nissan also gave this Pathfinder a much more truckish feel. This is weird because it is still a car underneath, but contrary to the Toyota where I feel like I'm sitting in a big sedan, this feels like a truck. I feel like I'm sitting high off the ground. I have this big square hood in front of me and the whole angular theme is repeated everywhere I look, around the dashboard, around here at the door. Even the infotainment system has a nice chiseled look. I quite like it. It gives it a truckish adventurous look, even if it's not exactly a truck. Now again, like the Highlander, this is a top spec uh, Pathfinder. It is a platinum trim level loaded with creature comforts. I have nice uh, uh, chocolate brown leather on door inserts. Build quality is fantastic. And I really like the, the, the materials that are used. Actually, compared to the Toyota, I find this is a lot more coherent. It's just, it feels more upscale and there's a lot more, uh, it makes more sense in the way that the leather and the black plastics and the nice polished aluminum were blended all together. There is some piano black, however, Nissan uses it all over the dashboard here and around the center console, but it's not too annoying. I mean, it, it's not located in the touch points, maybe around the, uh, the window controls, but it doesn't um, allow you to smudge it too much. All new steering wheel for 2022. It has a smaller hub with a flat bottom. Uh, it, it also feels nice and sporty when you hold it. Uh, what I particularly enjoy about this Pathfinder is the fully digital gauge pod. This allows you to customize it in a whole bunch of different manners. You can also have access to a lot of information. One feature I find 
particularly cool is how you can change the presentation of the dials. You press on this button right here, which says change meter view and the gauges move on the side in a really awesome animation and it doesn't lag. It's all done very fluently and it looks very cool. And you have access to more important information like for example, your uh, driver assistance uh, technology or fuel consumption. So Nissan integrates a uh, manual shift lever, but it's not the full transmission lever like in the Highlander, it's just a little knob. Uh, so it takes up a lot less space and it's cool. I mean, I like the way it operates. It just slides and it feels of good quality. There's a nice springy feeling in it. Now, obviously this could have been replaced by buttons. It's essentially a large button, but it has a nice, just a nice grip to it. And it just makes shifting into drive that much more interesting. The center console offers ample storage, obviously the two large cup holders right here, a tiny little storage here for my phone. So this is also handy. I also have the wireless charge pad here in the front. Now, contrary to the Highlander, I only have two USB ports in the front. The Highlander had three, but I have USB-C on top of having standard USB port. And I have the auxiliary socket here at the bottom as well. Standard center console, nothing fancy here. Just open and throw your stuff in it, but it's not as deep as in the Toyota. So it's, it's, it's quite shallow if you compare it to its direct competitor. Seats are comfortable, not as plush as in the Highlander, however. I have good lumbar support, but I don't have that cool springy feeling Lexus-like comfort that I had in the Toyota. But I can see how this can be comfortable for long trips. I would have preferred a bit more side lateral support, however. I'm a big guy and I feel like I'm falling off the seat all the time. And now onto the center stack. Now, like the Toyota, uh, Nissan blends touch controls with physical buttons. I have physical controls here for HVAC controls. They're very well laid out, easy to use, large knobs that you can use with your gloves in winter. That's a nice touch. Up here, again, I have physical buttons for the main uh, controls. Now, this also has a weird menu button, which is also home. But contrary to Toyota, it doesn't say menu and home. It's just menu. So when you press menu, you're in the home screen. Now, this is a lot simpler than what you get in the Highlander. Yes, the interface is somewhat dated in terms of its graphics, but it responds quickly. And I, I, can, I can have, I can quickly, but it responds quickly. I can easily access my information. I can get my audio, audio information down here, Bluetooth audio, my settings. Everything's well laid out. There's nothing hidden. There's nothing that I need to dig deep for uh, to have access to the information. The interface is a bit laggy. I've seen quicker in some Korean or American products, but this gets the, the job done. I mean, it's not painful. It's just, it, it, it operates properly. It gets you the information that you want quickly. Pairing your phone is a bit longer here than in the Toyota. Uh, there's a bit more of fiddling required. Once you're connected, uh, it presents the information properly. Android Auto um, and uh, Apple CarPlay are, are both wireless with this vehicle. And still around the center console, Nissan integrates a drive mode selector, a lot more modes to choose from this time around. I have a little knob right here so I can go between Eco, Sport and Tow. But if I go on the other side, I have all-terrain mode. So I can go into the snow mode, mud, rut, or sand. So I have more than just the trail option in the Highlander. I also have a hill descent control feature. What that's gonna do is apply the brakes automatically when I'm going down a hill. So the Pathfinder has more adventure seeking modes. But again, this is a car, it's not a truck. So don't expect to go in a big muddy trail or attack the Rubicon trail with this thing, but it will get you out of a tricky situation. Again, I'll get a chance to drive this, this big guy right here this summer. So I'll, hopefully I'll be able to really test out its all wheel drive features. Total cargo space for the new Pathfinder is up there among the uh, best ones in this class. Actually, uh, Nissan uh, upgraded the cargo space. You're getting a bit more for 2022, but it's still behind segment leaders like the Honda Pilot, Kia Telluride, or even the Volkswagen Atlas. Now, I want to show you the configuration. So obviously, like in any three-row SUV, you can lower the third row and the second row as well. And this is done actually quite cleverly. You can first uh, lower the headrests. If these things are in your way when you're driving, you can lower them so you get better rear visibility. And to lower them, you just have your clips right here. Very classic stuff, nothing electronic. Gives weight to a whole 
uh, flat floor. Now here underneath, I also have access to a storage area uh, to throw more gear. It's all plastic in there as well, so it's handy if you've got some, uh, some tools or some sports equipment. The Highlander, on the other hand, unfortunately trails a bit behind in terms of total cargo space. It is a much uh, tighter uh, rear area and you see it right away. It's not packaged the same way as in the uh, Pathfinder. I can't uh, manually uh, lower my headrests uh, neither like I could do with the straps that you saw in the Nissan. Lowering the rear seats is the same affair. I pull on the clips up here and I have access to a large loading floor. I also have the uh, uh, lower section compartment right here as well, but not as much space as in the Pathfinder. Nissan hides the uh, spare wheel tools, whereas Toyota puts them directly in this section, so that compromises some cargo space. Now the towing rating for the uh, new Pathfinder is still 6,000 pounds, so it's, it's considerably higher than most vehicles in this class. Now in the uh, three row uh, midsize SUV category, 5,000 pounds seems to be the magic number. You're getting 1,000 more from this Nissan. But what you need to understand about these vehicles is that the 6,000 pound rating is only when the vehicle is empty. Once this thing is loaded with kids and you've got, I don't know, some gear on the roof and the trunk is filled up to the roof, you're not gonna be able to tow as much. We're gonna go down as maybe to about 4,000 pounds. The old Pathfinder had a reputation of squatting its rear suspension when under heavy load. Uh, I didn't have a chance to try this one yet. Apparently Nissan has greatly improved the rear suspension accordingly. So it'll be interesting to see how uh, this big, big guy can carry a boat or a camper. Now towing for the Toyota Highlander with the V6 engine is rated at 5,000 pounds, so standard uh, midsize SUV stuff right here. However, if you opt for the hybrid, you're really gonna lose a lot of that towing rating. It's only rated to 3,500 pounds. However, like, uh, like I said earlier, it's the same story for the Highlander. If it's fully loaded with kids and gear, you're not gonna be able to tow 5,000 pounds. These things are actually quite sensitive to load, just like the Honda Pilot. So if you're thinking about carrying a lot of people while towing, you know, try to aim more 3,500 to 4,000 pounds if you wanna stay safe. So access to the Highlander's second row is very easy. I have a large door here that allows me to get in. I, I'm a big guy. Uh, I'm sitting behind myself at the moment. I have plenty of leg room and headroom as well. Now this is the captain uh, chair configuration. Same thing on the Pathfinder. So I got two seats with a center console, but I can not have it in a three seat uh, configuration. And I have a cool visor right here, which is handy if I want people to not see what I look like from the rear. So now with the Pathfinder, well, right off the bat, ingress is a lot easier than in the Toyota, but the doors are smaller. The floor is lower, but getting in is simpler for some reason. Okay, so um, overall leg room is fantastic. Headroom is a bit tighter than in the Toyota. I feel because I'm sitting a bit higher and I can't, I'm just gonna check now, I can't lower the rear seat. Same kind of adjustments as in the Highlander. I have these gigantic cup holders here on the side. Look at the size of these cup holders. I got two cup holders just for myself. And I have another storage area for my phone right here. And like the Toyota, I have my handy little visor. So here you have it, two popular midsize SUVs. I hope you guys liked this rundown. And again, I apologize if I'm not driving them. This is a new format, so let me know what you think about it. One thing I am noticing is that Nissan really did its homework with the new Pathfinder. It's longer, roomier, much more attractive inside while retaining the qualities that it already had. 6,000 pound towing rating when it's empty, naturally aspirated V6 engine that has proven itself to being quite reliable in the past, and finally, the removal of the CVT. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because not only are CVTs extremely boring and annoying to drive, Nissan has had some serious reliability issues with them in the past. Now they're gone. Nine-speed ZF automatic. It seems to be the same transmission that Honda puts in the Pilot. That one also had some issues as well in the beginning, but they seem to have been fixed. Anyway, it'll be interesting to see how the Pathfinder will fare in the long run. Like I said, I'm gonna drive this bad boy soon. The Highlander, it is cr more cramped back there than the Nissan, but it has a very fancy interior, plush 
seats. And the fact that it comes in a hybrid powertrain really allows it to separate itself from its rivals. If you don't need to tow, if all you need is a reliable and fuel efficient family shuttle, this is a very good option. Resale value is also through the roof with the Highlander. However, I personally love the way the Pathfinder looks. I like it in this green color. And with it, I do believe that Nissan has a shot of becoming a segment leader once again.